Hello, everybody out in LinkedIn and on YouTube. I am Caroline Brookfield. I'm so excited to bring you uh, another episode of Creative Lifescaping, where I interview people who don't seem very creative, and they'll help us understand how they can use creativity to uh, make their life better. So I am so excited. I'm a little fangirling right now uh, for our, my guest this week. Um, Leanne Davey is my guest this week. And for the last 25 years, Leanne has been researched and advised teams on how to achieve high performance. She's known as the teamwork doctor, and she's worked with teams from the front lines to the boardroom across a variety of industries and around the globe from Boston to Bangkok. In working with hundreds of teams, including global Fortune 500 companies, she's developed a unique perspective on the challenges that teams face and how to solve them. Uh, we're going to be talking today mostly about detoxifying your job. Leanne is a New York Times bestselling author and keynote speaker, which is where I first met Leanne, and then I kind of stalked her, and uh, that's how we got to know each other. So welcome, Leanne. Hi, Carolyn. It's great to be here. This is a great way to spend a Friday afternoon and uh, talk about creative lifescaping. Thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to join me. And I know that um, your area is on organizational psychology. That's where you've done your master's and PhD work and where you speak most of your time. So I always like to start off with, um, like, is that what you wanted to be as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> an organizational psychologist. So um, my true story is when I was a little kid, um, I used to watch this children's program, local children's program called the Polka Dot Door. And the Polka Dot Pokeroo. Door. Yeah, Pokeroo. Exactly. Um, and one of the things on the show was factory tours. They used to go open the Polka Dot on the Polka Dot Door and take you on factory tours of how they made crayons and all those sorts of things. And I could not get enough of factory tours. And so I was really into it. And at some stage in my life, I realized that I wasn't really going to be good at industrial engineering or any of that stuff. But, you know, as that was happening, going through the 80s and the really the shift of our manufacturing economy to a knowledge economy, it became clear to me that the machine of the modern workforce is actually a team. It's, it's in knowledge work, right? That factory is a team. And so I you know, stumbled upon organizational psychology in undergrad and was madly in love from the very, very first time that I took a course. And that was, uh, I guess, 1990 was the first time I took, it's been a while. Um, and it was a great choice. I still adore it. So I wasn't going to be, although it's fun because in my client work, I really prioritize clients that have cool factories. So throughout my whole career, I've been able to go to really, I've been a mile underground in a copper mine. I've been on the Mars chocolate bar factory floor. I've seen them make um, edge shave gel. I, like I try and get factory tours as not goodness knows not to do anything useful there, but at least to play and see. So that's that's how I went from being a junkie for factory tours to uh, organizational psychology. That's so that's so great. You can look it back to the polka dot door and just being so interested in like how things work and your yeah. curiosity, right? Which probably drove you to find that. That's, that's absolutely. And so when you're doing your current role, do you ever consciously think back to that time when you were a kid and your curiosity or things that you love to do at that time? How do you how do you kind of meld that into build a career that you love? Yeah, I think about it all the time. And, you know, the other thing I love about my career is the other thing I, I am a, a creative person, if not a talented creative. <laughs> so I've always <laughs> I've always liked to craft to do that kinds of thing and and part of the fun for me in this role is that you can bring a little bit of that in so you know I spend a lot of time uh, reading research reports I spend a lot of time consulting with teams on very heavy issues but the chance to kind of make a fun um, learning tool or poster to go with a, a course I'm teaching or things like that I, I do like to be able to you know, pull up Canva every once in a while and 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 play. Who doesn't like playing in Canva? It's like, well, I think I there are people, but I don't know them. Okay. <laughs> I was going to save this for later, but I'm going to do it now since we're okay. on the topic. And I've never done this before. So I see how this works. Fun. This is what I did in Canva. Yeah, bring it back. I, didn't even get <laughs> I don't know. Well, how did it go? It just, it just must not loop. 
It's like the toxic workplace, it God. just goes away on its own. How do I make it stop going away? It's like the people simmering, because I made some comment in our about our in promotion for this. If you're the if you're the cook at the if you're at the stove or the person simmering in the toxic stew. Yes. I yeah, see, and I like just a little dash of that creative stuff in my week. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the most, uh, one of my, my friends, John Brewer, uh, he will remember this story from a very long time ago, but I was asked to, uh, be the host or the chair of a conference for the conference board. Oh. And it was lots of serious people talking about compensation and such other serious things. And one of the jobs of the chair is to listen to every talk. And mm -hmm. let me tell you, some of these were rather monotone and painful. And to then summarize, you know, the day and that sort of thing. And just live spontaneously, I decided to summarize the entire day and all the talks in a in an epic poem. <laughs> yeah. And it was every once in a while, I'll still meet people who are like, are you the poem lady? And this was like, probably 2002 to something like that. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I do, I do better when I have just a, a little dash sprinkle, sprinkle soups of creativity. Of creativity. <laughs> every once in a while. Well, it's funny when you're saying that it sounds like the when you put those pieces of creativity into your day, it like lightens your mood or yeah, keeps you more I engaged. Need it. Is that yeah? It it yeah, it lightens my mood, it recharges my batteries. Um, you know, the work that I do about toxic workplaces, mm -hmm. about team dynamics, about business strategy, it's wonderful work. I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. trade it for anything, but it, it's intimate work. Uh, you mm -hmm. can't do it without being all in with the team you're working mm -hmm. with. Um, the, the topics I've been spending this month on LinkedIn in a whole series about psychological safety and toxic workplaces, mm -hmm. you know, at some point you need to stop and plug into the wall. Right? It's like, okay, my, I'm at zero bars. Yes. <laughs> so I need to like come back up. So that's some um, creative things and and you know same in my spare time a lot of my resilience strategies have a creative piece to them so um i i am taking it is not pretty but i am taking both tap dancing and adult hip-hop i started hip-hop hip -hop at 49 49 <laughs> that's the time you should learn to do hip-hop so it's yeah never a bad time to do hip-hop well I, I may be reaching the point where i might break a hip soon but so far so far so good well, and you know, what you're saying is I know that you're, uh, you know, a, a, a data nerd and a, and a scientist is what you're, what you say is supported by the, the data that says that creativity lifts your mood, makes you yeah. feel better. You know, and, and Ipsos did a study and said, um, like 89% of people feel like creativity lifts their mood and 76% of them are like, even if it's bad, it still makes yeah. me feel good. Yeah. So. You know, it's really, really interesting. Here, Here's a point in time kind of thing. This whole wordle phase. Are you wordling? Oh, yes, yes. I didn't do very well yesterday. Or there's a birdle now. And I'm like, I can't. Oh. Oh. Well, I, I've been wordling. And uh, so it's really interesting because my brother, who's a PhD cancer research scientist, like I, I'm the, the slacker in the family. Um, and so he has the strategy of what are the three words that uh -huh. are the best first three words to figure out. I'm like, ew, what, yeah. why would you ruin this lovely bit of serendipity in the day? Like every once in a while, I come up with my word for the next day when I'm going to bed at night. And, and all of a sudden I'll be like, and yesterday, what, what was it? Like I came up with like minor or something. Yeah. And I actually got the word in two and and sent the thing i know a two and i sent the thing and he's like what was your first guess like obviously your first guess was a bad guess if you got those letters right and i was like it was just so interesting to me because he he's trying to well he is a star trek fan he's trying to like mr spock it he's trying to like outthink it like, yes I, it's like five minutes in my day of a little bit of just like spontaneity and serendipity and I, like i choose a different word every day different right so wordle has been this great it's a psychologist of me great projective test then somebody else who i follow online um josh burnoff another big big brain mit math kind of guy and like he he beat the crap out of the algorithm and figured out what the best like oh 
it just makes me kind of sad. And it was like, mm -hmm. oh, it's really helpful to understand that different people bring different lenses, different thought processes. But for me, Wordle for me is a creative projective test. Yes. For them, it's it's a logic test. So it's it, something to it, figure out. Like people a problem interesting? Yeah. yeah. Unlike yeah. you, I pick a different word every time. And I had one that I got in two before, but then other times I'll get it in six. So probably the average of your brother and the math people, it's probably like three or four. Yeah. But they probably don't get it in two. I, well, <laughs> yes, because they have all these very in, intelligent, like the, the right, that's not the right way to do it. I'm like, yeah. okay. <laughs> I love that. I am just like you. Well, and speaking of, so, you know, we can, one of the things I love about you on LinkedIn, which I want to talk about later is your, your, how much creativity you bring to your serious topics. So this month you've been focusing on toxic cultures and psychological safety. Like what got you fired up now about it? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think I was starting to get angry in the fall about how inhumane our workplaces have become. Mm -hmm. And mostly from just conversations with my clients and and just how often they just need a moment to hey can we just connect and can I just share with you what I'm feeling can I share the load with you for a few minutes and that sort of thing and and that really got me feeling like this is not good this is not healthy uh and it became really important to me to to start to spend a month and really go deeply into it was interesting. I, I started Googling toxic workplaces and all the stuff I found, all the stuff that ranked on toxic workplaces was interestingly um, millennials, younger people, a lot younger than me. Uh, and it was all these sort of signs that your workplace was toxic, oh, but yeah, not top 10 signs. You yeah, should be here. Yeah. It, yeah. It was like listicles, but nothing around like, what is the construct of a toxic workplace? What are the different aspects of it? What are my options? And yeah, that was the really interesting thing. On none of those sites, is there anything about what do you do about it? Yeah. So I, I just felt like I could bring something and serve in this space to bring some research about it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also uh, the type that likes to be a little edgy. So I came out hard on a LinkedIn Live with them. Um, Stephen Chudletsky, I came out really hard saying, hey, a huge amount of what we're talking about is psychological danger is only psychological discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, we need a little suck it up buttercup going on. Yeah. So it just, I felt like I could bring something to this, both amplifying and explaining what really is toxic and helping us take that much more seriously, but also you know, letting a little air out of the toxic workplace balloon where now people are just saying it for things that, okay, come on, really, that's yeah. not toxic. Yeah, like yeah. I saw, was it yesterday, your post about it's not toxic if your boss gives yeah. you some constructive criticism on the report. <laughs> I know. What, Did they hurt your feelings? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and a lot of people don't know that difference. So have, so give me an example or maybe think about the things that you've seen in organizations where you have seen a change away from talks or either an individual has made a change in their own yeah. environment other than quitting, I guess, to get away from and or how organizations have successfully identified and transitioned away from a toxic environment. I know it's probably a big thing, but. Yeah. Um, and, and it's definitely possible. What's really interesting because my work is primarily with team, almost exclusively with teams. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the first thing is that so often what we, the big problem is that we don't even know why we're a team. Mm -hmm. It's essentially just, well, we all report to the same person. So we get together on Tuesdays like that. That's it. And without a true sense of purpose, there's not much resolve to focus on what matters more. And it's really easy to just get trapped in the drama. <laughs> so uh -huh. it, one of the best things that we do in our team effectiveness process is to define what is the business counting on this team for? What is the highest and best use of our time? What are they counting on us to do? It's amazing how often simply answering that question does a lot to resolve what has become toxic. And instead of pointing fingers and judging, we start to say, okay, what could and should this team be doing? And as people kind of get a vision in their heads, a picture of what it needs to look like, they'll start to be like, oh yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I 
that's not quite how I've been showing up. So you've never <laughs> had to judge them. You've never had to like discipline them. You've simply allowed them to paint a picture that there's something more important, something bigger than them that they need to achieve. That's one of the simplest, best, least painful things you can do to turn around a situation that's that's become toxic. Um, second thing we spend a lot of time doing, our process always includes um, a psychological assessment because much of the time what's going on in a toxic environment is the members of the team are not really aware of what they need from their environment to be psychologically safe. And because of that, they are no good at advocating for what they need. Mm -hmm. So if they were in a better position to understand and advocate to get their needs met, uh, it would be much less toxic. So we spend a lot of time on that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's it's skills. We So conflict is something near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't know how to have conflict well, if we don't have the skills and processes around it, we tend to get into what I call conflict debt and resentment builds, and that's very toxic. So we're often building skills. So it's this, you know, really deliberate process from first helping them understand a, a, a higher cause what they're there for mm -hmm. um, imagine what that looks like then you know do a better job a lot of people in this scenario they're like wounded animals and the bad behavior is sort of self-protective mm -hmm. so we try and help them understand how to get their needs met in a constructive way and then okay once we've got that figured out now we just need to build some new skills and put in a few new habits and and we can move from there. So, you know, that's my job. I see it all the time with teams that have been, eef, um, I don't know if, you know, not too many that are toxic, although it's happened in my career, but certainly where there's been some real friction um, yeah. and, and get them to, okay, wow, this feels so much better. Yeah. I love that process. And I feel like it sounds like you're like, is I don't know if it's an overused cliche term, but like connecting with your why, like connecting them with their purpose and grounding them in that and then giving them the tools they need. It kind of reminds me of this parenting approach we've been trying to figure out, my husband and I, it's called collaborative problem solving. And the, mm -hmm. the kind of mantra of that is kids do well when they can. Yeah. And when I'm working with someone that's that's a challenge, I say to myself, adults do well when they can. Like what's missing here? Like you said, whether it's um, a tone of behavior that's just copied throughout an organization or whether it's just people don't have the skills or they don't know themselves enough to know how to advocate for themselves. I think that's fantastic because and that would spill over into their personal lives as well like oh, if you right oh yes oh yes when i wrote the good fight it's funny because i wrote nine chapters about bringing productive conflict into your organization i'm like mm -hmm. i can't end the book yet so the final chapter is called try this at home you know those old car commercials where it would always come up in the fine print and say do not close track do not try this at home yeah. so i thought i'm going to write the try this at home chapter so it's all I start with the story of my husband and me in the in the psychologist's office having mar marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm pretty vulnerable and open about the fact that if you're not good at conflict, uh, you're not going to be good at relationships. I talk about um, how to raise conflict resilient children. I talk about why our charity and volunteer and community groups suck worse than <laughs> worse than anywhere else. So yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's I love important that. to me that and and so often, so often, um, as we're going through this process with executives in the workplace, they're kind of we we did have one where we were doing the psychological assessment and sharing the findings and one actually the president is whispering to the person beside him and i i've given him the stink eye for <laughs> for whispering and how that's against the rules and i said anything you'd like to share with the group and he's <laughs> like i just said it explains my first divorce <laughs> <laughs> so we all had a good laugh but yes all of the skills that we do uh, in the teams people promptly take home and find that they get just as much or more traction there I love that. And I just put your website up here if anyone's looking for more about your you know, programs and services and um, you, you know what you do with teams there at leannedavy.com. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you because you, when I saw you speak at the Art of Leadership. <laughs> me too, me? <laughs> well, you're my guest, so I guess I kind of want to talk about you. Like I'm obvious. used to talking about everybody else. Yeah. I, I'd like to have you come on my show, but I don't want to talk about you at all. <laughs> 
no, see the safe thing from where I sit. I just talk about everybody else's dysfunction. Like, what do you mean? I got to talk about my own? Okay, go ahead. We have a, a little tangent. We have a, a games night on Sunday night of two teenage boys and we call it forced family fun. And then <laughs> one of my sons brought Good to call a spade a spade, Carolyn. That's exactly. a good idea. So my son invited a friend who was like, that sounds cool. And I was like, invite him. And we were playing this game called Killer Bunnies, where you have to like kill each other's bunnies. And it's it's a little chaotic. And I looked at his friend and I was like, are you glad you came now? Like, <laughs> he's just like, what's going on here? So I can totally That's relate. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah. But when, when I saw you speak at the Art of Leadership, one of the things that struck me about you was this balance. You know, my brand is artful science, this this blend between humor and performance and the science and trying to make things that are credible, and more interesting. You alluded to this um, conference board and how boring things are. And for me, I mean, it's I, 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 it doesn't the irony doesn't escape me that I've read so many boring books on creativity. Um, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. But it's true. And you are no, it's true. creative people I know on LinkedIn. So like your your posts are pictures of you with stamps on your head, shoveling the driveway, and then you tie that into like a really important and impactful message about, you know, teamwork or, or organizations. Like, how did that happen? Were you always like that? Is this something or is this something that's developed? No, I wasn't always like that. Like, I think I'm a playful person at some level, naturally. Um, and yet I went on to LinkedIn sharing my Harvard Business Review articles with the best of them. Please refer to figure A, where I share with you the latest read, right? Like, and, and then all of a sudden, I started thinking about how I interact with LinkedIn and mm. how I just kind of, if I'm on my phone, I just do this. I'm like corporate bump, article I don't have time to read, mm -hmm. video I'm not going to click. And I started realizing that, like, I, I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the time. I want LinkedIn to deliver for me some juicy little tidbit that caused me to go like, oh, <laughs> and and maybe if if I hit the exact right day to hit the the oh, somebody may say oh oh that's my oh and actually I had one this week it was so funny my my post on Monday was yeah. about this crisis junkie team one of my five toxic teams and I got a message that day may we please have a call tomorrow we <laughs> need you right away can you write a proposal so every once in a while it it does hit and it matches. But generally what I'm trying to do is say, look, um, I want to give you leading research, the best content, something different than the easy things that other people are telling you. But mm -hmm. I want to give it to you with a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. So I, I do uh, adopt the Mary Poppins philosophy. <laughs> so uh, like I can do cool tricks for sure, just like she can. You can you should see what I can pull out of my bag. But at the same time, uh, the, you know, doing it with a bit of a, a song and a dance uh, makes it a little easier to tolerate what can be really uncomfortable mm -hmm. stuff. And, and of course, what happened is I tried it a couple times and, you know, don't don't encourage me. LinkedIn just went crazy encouraging me. People sending me notes. Oh, this was so. Oh, yeah. And people don't encourage me because then, of course, I'm just going <laughs> to then I'm coming up with what's the next crazy picture I can superimpose on my forehead next. So I apologize for my in Canva goodness. in Canva. That was one of your rabbit holes. Definitely one of my Canva rabbit holes. But what I'm trying to do is and, and the basic philosophy, and I do this from the stage as a keynote speaker as well. I like I make myself look ridiculous. And, and I had one talk where I just stopped in the middle of the speech. I'm like, please never underestimate my willingness willingness to look ridiculous for your benefit. And that's how I think about it. Like if I can look ridiculous, if I can show them my five chins um, and that's going <laughs> to cause them to get a new insight about their own team effectiveness, how I, like I did a whole series that I was really proud of about all the dysfunctional coworkers and the mm -hmm. final the final one of the thing was I wanted to call it what if you're the asshole, but I just called it what if you're the jerk. Um, yeah. <laughs> because if I can give people stuff and and kind of with that spoonful of sugar, get them to like, oh, maybe mm -hmm. I really do need to think about whether I'm the toxic one. Well, then I'm doing my service. So I just find yeah. I got to stop the scroll somehow. And people don't seem to stop the scroll for the latest HBR posts. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's almost like you're, um, you know, sticking your neck out because you know it works and you're willing to willing to do that. We have a comment here from Alejandro who says it probably related to our um, comment about the uh, parenting. That's mm -hmm. gold. Meet everyone where they are at. The key to parenting and leadership. Yeah, great comment. Thank you. Hey, Alejandro. Oh. Alejandro is one of the, so I refer to my LinkedIn as my living room and the comments section as my couch. So what I'm, I'm trying to become the coolest couch on LinkedIn and have the juiciest, most interesting, most thought provoking conversations. And Alejandro is fantastic at plopping himself down on the LinkedIn couch and engaging with really thoughtful ideas. And so I am very grateful to him <laughs> for, um, for making my LinkedIn toxic workplace party really, uh, really good. <laughs> That's awesome. I am grateful to Alejandro as well. So this, that this actually segues really well into one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, not so much about toxic teams, but maybe it is like as someone who has been in academia doing a PhD and your, you know, high level as far as data and research, Ex this you know where I'm going with this no I don't keep oh. going <laughs> <laughs> I like your I'm like yeah. so, so no, okay one of my one of my jobs impressive sorry he was making me feel very impressive <laughs> oh Alejandro is like joining and he says you make it super easy oh yay that makes yeah. me feel great send some love to keep it Alejandro. up keep it up I heart you I can't mm -hmm. do it I'm too close um so when I was um working for a pet food manufacturer for veterinary pr products. I was the vet that would go into vet schools and vet clinics and teach those people how to heal or to treat medical conditions with food. Yeah. So academic environment. And I'm like you, I'm like, it doesn't have to be boring. Why does it have to be boring to be educational? Yeah. But there's always that subset of people who are like, it's not serious enough and it diminishes your credibility if there's too much playfulness and there's too much fun. So what do you what do you think about that and how or if you need to get around that at all? I think there are so many excellent team effectiveness consultants they can work with other than me. <laughs> and and partly it's an abundance mentality. It's like mm -hmm. I'm really really fortunate that at this stage in my career the phone rings. Uh, I have uh, we have to turn away teams that want to work with us because we only work with five uh, in any given year because we go deep and it's mm -hmm. big work and it's intimate. Um, and so I'm like, OK, well, you know, it's OK. I, I think that that's right for you. If mm -hmm. if there isn't playfulness, if if playfulness feels either condescending or it doesn't do justice to your experience of it. That's okay. It's absolutely okay. What I've learned is that silly stories and metaphors and things like that make it easier to talk about hard, hard things. So let me give you one silly example. So yeah. we use an assessment tool and one of the dimensions on this assessment tool helps us understand how much somebody's either a black and white thinker. They like to make things very unambiguous, very clear so that they can make a decision and act. And on the other end of that same spectrum, people who see nuance and see gray area. So I use this silly story. I always say, okay, so imagine it's it's morning, you're rushing off to work and you notice your toilet bowl is cracked. Mm -hmm. So the decisive unambiguous person is like, okay, I'm gonna hit Home Depot on my way home. I'm gonna change out the toilet, we're good. And that's kind of how they see the world. Change the mm -hmm. toilet, we're fine. The, the person at the other end of the spectrum is like, oh man, when I change that toilet, it's going to have a different footprint because this was a weird bowl that they don't even make anymore, which means the tiles aren't going to work right. I'm going to have to change the tiles. When I change the tiles, that's going to wreck how it meets up against the hallway. I should just sell the house. <laughs> and I tell that story. Uh, and again, people should not encourage me. I was in a session a while back. And somebody starts to go bright red in the face as I'm telling this story. <laughs> and he he looks at he looks at my husband and me because we facilitate together. He's like, it was the stove, not the toilet. <laughs> and I just looked at him because no, really, I sold the house. <laughs> and so it, it it's a fun story because in the moment, so we have teams that we've told the story to and we work with. And in the moment, instead of saying, like, you know, Frank, stop worrying about everything. We can't. Mm -hmm you know, deal with all the, all they do is like, Frank, it's just a toilet. 
And that humor and that easy clipped language, when Frank hears that, Frank's like, oh, yeah, I know. Okay, good point. I don't need to sell the house. And it's easier. It's So my playfulness in some sense is me being standoffish and just saying like, well, if you don't like me, I don't need you. But really what it is, if I'm being more serious, is I know from experience that for so many people, that little bit of humor, those inside jokes, that shared language, those metaphors are ways we can come at hard things from the side door mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of like yeah. in the front door where they can slam it in our faces. So that's, that's my, that's my take. Well and I also wonder, like, when you talk about that, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of um, when we're faced with ambiguity or uncertainty, we tend to jump to status quo solutions, like kind of a survival mechanism. And I wonder if humor almost like slaps us in the face, and it gives us that moment to be mindful of like, whoa, where am I? Where am I? Oh, I'm not like in the savannah running from a tiger. I'm actually just trying to fix a toilet, right? right? So right. I, I, I don't know if there's any evidence on that, but that, that's what it I'm curious about. It just feels, yeah. And, and the other thing that's really interesting, I was having this conversation on LinkedIn yesterday with with uh, Deb Mashik, who does this great work about oh. collaboration. And she yes. was showing this awesome video of how you take these certain geometric shapes and when you when you see them reflected in a mirror, so these shapes were actually like diamond shaped. But when you see them reflected in the mirror, they look like circles. And it's such a great optical illusion because you're like, what? And I was telling her that there's some new evidence that when an idea is one that we tend to resist or we don't want to change our minds, when someone uses a lot of words to tell us why we should change our minds, we tend to put up the wall. Mm -hmm. But if we have a visual, just a mm -hmm. picture, that um, changes our minds more readily. So some of what I'm doing is trying to create pictures in people's minds mm -hmm. so I don't need a lot of words. If I can just say toilet and they automatically imagine like either a for sale sign <laughs> Or on the other end, a, a, you know, a toilet where the tiles don't actually fit. And because what I'm trying to say is like, maybe it's not just the toilet in this case, but that visual um, creates less resistance than using a lot of words. So I'm always trying to go back to psychology, basic science, research about some of the things that allow us to get at these team effectiveness things in a way that's going to be stickier, be more effective. And it's often not head on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. It's about being effective. And so when you went from your PhD to your now, like your playful vibe, was there a transition there? Like you oh, said, yeah. you try some things and wh how does, how does fear of judgment influence that or did it? How did that work for you? Okay. So I was 26 when I finished my PhD and uh, I was trying to figure out, I had I had this PhD in organizational psychology. It was 1998. Um, and the employee engagement craze was in full, full mm -hmm. bore. And I knew the currency I had was that I was very heavily into statistics and measurement in my, because of the kind of research I did. Mm -hmm. And so I traded this currency I had being good at statistics for a job in working with employee surveys because I knew it would give me access to very senior people because employee surveys get reported to, I know. Um, my dad used to tease me that I was too young and I needed to get gray streaks. I laugh now, I always, my dad is gone now, but I'm like, hey, how am I doing now, dad? I got all, I, and actually it's funny, I tell the colorist, I'm like, I needed these gray streaks for a lot of years. Can you leave them? Because, uh, <laughs> um, and so I was living in, I was 26 and going to literally even board meetings of boards of directors who wanted to see employee surveys. So it was, um, it, it was definitely my, my role models, the people around me wore Navy suits with gold buttons. Um, they wore pumps, they wore hose, they, you know, that was certainly the world of consulting in 1998. So it was a while before I started to feel like uh, it needed to be different. It wasn't until I engaged um, a speaking coach, oh. uh, that the speaking coach, every time he saw a video, if you want torture, this is torture. So I had to videotape all my keynotes. Then we would go, yeah, no, this is inhumane. I think the Geneva Conventions actually prohibit this, but, um, and I had to watch the entire 45 minute speech with him with the volume off. 
and, and a purchase just, technique apparently oh, it was effective but probably torture i was oh, yeah, yeah both yeah both yeah. yeah um and it was like what are you conveying what are you telling the audience right now with your body language well, like what and then you had to watch it again with the sound on and <laughs> so it was he who really kept saying to me, oh, did you see that moment of Leanne? Did you see that moment where she mm -hmm. broke through? Did you see that twinkle in the eye? Did you see that like oversized gesture? Did you see, right? Or he did some kind of like wiggle or, and so he just, you remember that old Christopher Walken, more cowbell on SNL? Oh, yes. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So he used to just be like, more Leanne, more Leanne, more Leanne. And then I went to more speaking training. And just every time I was more myself, sort of a bigger, more authentic version of myself, made bigger choices, um, I everybody kept encouraging me. Like, I am a learning creature. People don't encourage me. If, if, you, <laughs> if you smile, if you laugh, if you send me a note to say you like it, you're going to get more of it. <laughs> no, that was I love that it. Was me. So, so it sounds I, like I you had a mentor a or someone that coached you to do that. You saw the benefit, like the positive results and just doubled down on that. Exactly. So what would you say, say to someone who's either in a corporate environment, whether they're speaking or whether they just want to show up more of, some th of themselves at work and be more creative, show more of their inner like creativity, whatever that is. Yeah. How would you tell them if they don't have a speaking coach would be to get over that hurdle? Yeah, I think start small, do some small thing. Um, I remember at one point, um, my colleague, Tammy Herman and I were running a program called Women of Influence. We were helping people become, have greater influence and have more executive presence. And part of the deal, we were coaching them and there was all that good stuff. But we also managed to bring in a personal stylist to work Ooh. with. I know it was so fun. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, she worked with me as well. And she pushed me to try a couple. Of, she's like, um, I know you work with 50 year olds, but you don't need to dress like one. And I was like, oh, OK, thanks. And so she pushed me into a few things that I would never have chosen, mm -hmm. never have worn. I'm like the nerdy PhD. I would never have worn them. And it was a, incredible how just like not even opening my mouth, but wearing something with a lot more color or something with a different cut. And people are like, I love that. Just start small, do mm -hmm. tiny things in, uh, you know, you're given a presentation, put a, a, um, a, an image in the presentation that isn't a stock image clip art. It's, mm -hmm. you know, some fun picture of a kid doing something that relates to what's in your presentation. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, start small and you don't even okay. have to have it be animated or uh, like just start mm -hmm. small with something that just brings a little flavor. Um, you know, like uh, I think the cooking metaphor is a good one, right? We're now playing a lot with like zatar and all the and sumac and all these fancy spices. We didn't start with zatar and sumac, right? It was no. like, ooh, how about paprika? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, just a little paprika in your presentations for now. We'll work you up to see yeah. and, and see how it goes. If your manager, if your teammates, if your culture and your environment in your organization rejects it like a donor organ, then stop. Go back. And go, this, my workplace is toxic. Just write to me. <laughs> Like, yeah, it, it just right to me. We'll commiserate. We'll kvetch together. It's fine. Um, but, you know, try it. And what I found is people are so, you know, it's interesting. I was on a, I'm on a charity board and I was on a board meeting last night and I work really hard to bring a really positive energy to that board meeting. And somebody, one of the people just in the chat on the Zoom just said, thank you for your energy. Thank you. And, and all of a sudden you're like, you know, I didn't even know that anybody noticed or people are starved yeah. for energy, for mm -hmm. connection, for just something a little different than the four walls they've been staring at for two years. So I think this is a great time for creativity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was teaching uh, a course on how to thrive in a hybrid team this week. And, and just fun things like there's fun games you can play on Zoom where you you put the plot of a book or the plot of a movie just in emojis. You're only allowed to use emojis oh. <laughs> and, and people have to put in the chat and guess what they are. You know, like it takes five minutes to yeah. do that, but it's yeah. just something a little different in people's mm -hmm. days. And so I think the big opportunity right now is we are languishing. We are really struggling with how long this is going on for. 
And that little bit of creativity, that little paprika in the presentation that that you do, people will be so relieved and so glad. I think you'll get rewarded for it. So start small. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Start small. And I think one of the things I also for when it comes to expressing our own creativity is like do a quick um, like uh risk assessment. Like yep. if I put a bit of paprika in my presentation, am I going to get fired? Then maybe put a little bit of garlic instead or something. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I think exactly. really like stopping. How about just some pepper? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Which, like it's the idea of humor, like where, you know, what's the worst that could happen here. Right. Yeah. And then just like kind of inch your way towards that. Cause people who take chances, like people like you, Leanne, who go on stage and bring your full self and your vulnerability and your silliness, you didn't get there overnight. Like this yeah. is something that you do over over and over and you started with the pepper garlic paprika and so I think people need to start at that little bit and just realize that it's a muscle that the more you use yeah. the more you'll get better at it yeah I started in a blue suit with a brooch <laughs> right like I was like uh, I, I've come a long way baby and it's yes. funny because you know from the 26th I'm going to turn 50 in 10 days and, oh, and in those I'll be 50 in August we'll oh, be like the 72 girls and yeah. um, so in that time like I I'm getting less mature like I, I was really I probably seemed older and stuffier when I was 26 than yeah. I do at 50 so um yeah. it, it's okay <gasps> Matt, hey Matt. <laughs> yes, don't you think a little creativity is really going to stand out? And oh yeah, I've got some. Yeah. Oh, I have. I was. In, I was trying to share your LinkedIn, and now I got to go oh, back. Yeah. There's all kinds of posts here, like Alejandro saying <laughs> playfulness, and the stories make him a lot more humane. Yeah, Matt says love the emphasis on creativity. Um, yeah, and being different. And then Carly says the key is to do it authentically be yeah. who you are and don't try to be somebody else like put in the paprika but not somebody else's paprika you know what let's just stop on that one for a moment because carly's making a really great point sometimes i see people who are like oh you know i love what you do leanne and then they try and do leanne uh -huh. i'm like that just looks weird on you <laughs> right like it's like don't be me be you yeah. mm -hmm. um and it is that uh, authenticity. It is that version of, you know, what does it look like on you? Uh, and people will smell it immediately mm -hmm. if you're trying to be somebody else. And so, you know, I, I think that's excellent advice. Find your version. If it's not mm -hmm. like pull out the spice drawer and figure out which one is you. But, you know, in some ways you don't find out which one's you until you you know, try a few different things, but, but what you should be looking for is what just starts to feel, you know, that Michelangelo point about the sculptures in there, you, his job is only to strip away everything that isn't the sculpture, right? Yeah. I think, think about it more that way. It's not mm -hmm. building up. What I'm trying to do is strip away all the crap I learned you know, writing in the passive voice in graduate school and, and being a good consultant with hose and pumps. And all I'm trying to do is actually strip away all of that. So if anything, I'm more like Leanne at five, yeah. <laughs> at 50, st having stripped away all the stuff that isn't me, as opposed to trying to put on stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think Carly's point is so astute. Mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. like, we want this to feel like stripping away all the pretense, all the patina, all the expectations, all the crap that you've had from societal expectations. Strip that away. Don't feel like you're putting something on. So yeah, because it's a good point. If you're trying to do somebody else, it's like putting more stuff on. And then you're just getting farther, farther away from that five-year-old and that creativity that we were just so connected with. Right. And it's these layers that have weighed us down. And like you said, we need to um, strip those away. That's I love that. That's fantastic. Um, so this has been amazing. We've gone over time as always. I always. Oh my goodness! I didn't even notice. I was having no, too much no, no, no. It's not you. I'm enjoying this. You said you didn't have a hard stop, I so I was like, "All right, then we're gonna go." Until she's like, "I gotta go, Caroline," yeah. because I just okay. love these conversations, and you brought so much value on, like coming, like showing up as your true, authentic self, 
at work and in your life has not only helped you feel better, but it sounds like it's also one of the keys to building a more cohesive team where people oh, yeah. are showing, like using the skills to learn how to bring their full selves to work um, through work like you do with the, or effectiveness. Yeah, I always talk about, I used to have a speech with this in it. I haven't used it in a while, but I used to have a speech that was great people aren't well-rounded. Great people are pointy. So <laughs> just go be pointy at what you're pointy in, but then go find complimentary pointy people who who are pointy in things that you aren't, right? But but so much of our socialization is is like trying to wear down our, our points to try and be everything, be some perfect mm -hmm. example of things. And, you know, ugh, yeah. I just don't have time for that. So yeah, trying to just be the pointiest version of me and be as generous and of service with that pointiness I have, and then be completely open about the fact that, oh, yeah, no, I suck at that. <laughs> All the things that I really do suck at. Well, I think, as you know, because we've chatted about it over LinkedIn, is I had a late diagnosis of ADHD. Yeah. And I could explain so much. and so much shame as a kid of bringing my library book with a rotten apple smushed into it to school, you know, and feeling this. But that was, that's part of what I had. I need to own that and find mechanisms and people and support. Like, it's not okay to have a rotten apple, like, damage a library book, but like, what are the systems, but that's me and that's okay. I just need to learn how to manage that as opposed to feeling ashamed about my, my dysfunctional. Yeah. The framing system. I use is uh, strengths are great. Weaknesses are a given blind spots are scary. Uh, so, right. It, like with leaders, if you're going to be, if great people are pointy, you know, those strengths are great. So are the weaknesses. Cause you know about them. You hire a second in command who has, who yins to your yang and all those sorts of things. <laughs> Weaknesses are, are a given. That's not the problem. Blind spots are the problem. Yeah. And if you didn't know you had ADHD, if you didn't know that you needed nope. coping strategies, mm -hmm. um, if you start to interpret this as I'm a bad person or I'm not a good team player or anything else, that's where we get into trouble. So yeah. strengths, awesome. Weaknesses, a given. Blind spots, watch out. What? No blind spots. Okay, so I'm not gonna let you on the hook at the end okay. of every interview. When I remember, I do truth <laughs> or dare, and you chose truth. So I, truth. I would love if you would share. You're so vulnerable and open, and I love that you bring such a generosity to all of your posts, like that I see on LinkedIn, which is why I can love connecting with you and I follow you religiously. Um, but also in our interview together. And um, speaking of ADHD, I kind of forgot my train of thought. Oh, so it's not hard for you to share vulnerable stories, <laughs> but please share a story where you felt a bit embarrassed or where you were insecure and you went forward anyway. And uh, okay, this is my embarrassing story. Yeah. Grade 12. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still shattered. Um, grade 12. Uh, I was such a dork. I like to wear like pretty long skirts. I dressed like a 40 year old when I was 16, still embarrassing. Um, and I was wearing this long, beautiful brown skirt. I still think it was pretty. Was Just it from Northern seen. Reflections? No, it was um, um, Jacob Oh, it, oh back in the day. And uh, so my books were on the shelf in my locker, took all the books off the shelf in my locker, put them on the floor, put away the ones I didn't need, picked up the books I needed and headed all the way down the main hallway of the high school to my biology homeroom past so many people friend friends <laughs> and when i got to the biology room mr clark my biology teacher is like mm, your skirt is caught in your books uh-huh like up around uh -huh. your head <laughs> oh, no. and um yeah that was not awesome but it was interesting because I use that story. I can't believe I tell that story publicly all the time now, but I use it because my work is about conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to illustrate for people that being nice is crappy and too low a bar and stop being nice because nice is passive. Nice is comfortable for you. Yes. Uh, be kind because yes. kind is, is, is active, not passive. Kind is often uncomfortable for you instead of comfortable for you, but kind, um, makes people better, <laughs> makes the world better. And I really, really wish that I had passed one kind person in that hallway. Um, but I didn't. And, and they didn't have to be nice. They could have just grabbed your skirt and just like loser. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, they even could have been mean that that yeah, nice is selfish, Alejandro. Nice, nice yes, is selfish. Nice yeah. is selfish. And so uh it's protective, it protects us. We're it protects us from that discomfort, but it doesn't actually do anything for anybody else. So there you go. You can start your weekend imagining me in high school walking down the hall with my skirt in my books. Well, it's kind of fitting you were walking to biology class, I think. So a good point. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> and here's Leanne to demonstrate the lower torso. Yep. <laughs> the, the muscles of the human gluteus muscle. <laughs> Not good. Sorry, I'm laughing at your expense. All good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you can find Leanne at leannedavy.com. She's also on LinkedIn. And if you're watching this on LinkedIn, whether recording or live, uh, she's tagged as a speaker, so you should be able to find her magically clicking something. And uh, click I away, see what you find. What's that? Just click away and see what you find. Just keep clicking, see what happens. That's Thankfully, we strategy. didn't have cell phones back when I was in high school, so there's you're not going to find that if you click. It's safe. You know what? I think that all the time. <laughs> Exactly. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Leanne. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts on toxic teams and bringing your full self to work and having it a bit of fun. It was Thanks, so much Caroline. Fun. What okay. a fun way to spend the afternoon. Sounds good. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.